What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? It was a long film and it was a silent film. And I sat down in this theater and began to watch Sergei Eisenstein's October. And I had never seen such a thing. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I was seeing a silent film and there was no accompanying, accompanying music track. And, and, and my impression was that I could actually hear the sounds of what was going on, machine guns firing and crowds storming up and down staircases. And yet it was silent and I could hear everything through the, just the art of the editing. Uh, of course, this was a man who had uh, created and, and, and demonstrated the art of montage. I didn't know that, I was, just, I was steeped in the theater. And, and I, I, I was just riveted. I, I, I was perspiring when I was supposed to perspire. I was rooting for uh, the people I was supposed to rooting for. Above all, I heard everything. I couldn't believe that, that you could hear when there was no sound, just through the way the film was put together. And I came out after four hours absolutely emotionally uh, uh, exhausted. And I resolved in that moment that I was not going to go to the UCLA, uh, go to the, the film school at Yale, that instead I was going to go to the UCLA film school, which I knew about because my brother had gone to UCLA uh, and I was aware of it. But I always thought of myself, my ambition was to become a playwright and maybe direct plays in, <coughs> for theater. But after that experience, I resolved I was going to be a film director. And just like Eisenstein, because Eisenstein had been a man of the theater, he was a theater director who was recruited to make films uh, for the new, the new Soviet uh, uh, dictatorship, essentially, and uh, who valued the, the, the propaganda value of cinema. And so he... Uh, he, he began to make films in actual locations with the support of the government. And uh, his, of course, famous film made before October was Potemkin, the battleship Potemkin. But this was called October, 10 Days That Took the World, and it changed my life. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? Billy Friedkin did one of the most extraordinary uh, uses of cinema that that I ever saw because he made a film called The Law versus Paul Crump that saved the man's life. I never made a film that saved the man's life, but Billy Friedkin did. Uh, so many great contemporary artists that I saw that, that, that did things which I think are seminal, uh, uh, which of course October 10 days that took the, the world the, world was seminal. I, I don't know that I've made a, a seminal film. And if I, if, if I had, I would probably not even, I'd be too shy to suggest that it even edged in that direction. I know one thing, I was thrilled one day to get a letter from uh, David Lean uh, praising uh, a film I had made. I mean, I wish I had that letter. I don't, it disappeared, uh, but that was a treasure. To receive. Which of your own work comes closest to the quality of that first project that originally lit your fuse? My, my feeling is all my life what I really wanted to do as a kid and still now is I just want to be one of the group. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, if you, you know, because to me, you know, if you ask yourself the question, are you the greatest filmmaker ever existed? Of course not. And if you say then, if you were well, the worst, most terrible filmmaker who ever existed, you say, well, probably not. So basically, you're somewhere between the least important filmmaker and the most important, which means you're one of the group. And that's all I've ever won. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to reach that pinnacle? There are filmmakers to whom it's God-given. Roman Polanski was God-given talent. Uh, Steven Spielberg was God-given. William Wyler. I mean, what was he? He was a relative of a studio boss who just came out here, and but he had a God-given talent. The other form of talent, and I don't know that it's a lot less, 
is the talent that you have to work for. <laughs> I'm in that category. I, I, I don't, if I have anything given to me, it's I have a good imagination and, and, and I have a strange ability to see a little bit into the future. It's, a, it, it's weird. It's, I don't know where that comes from. But I, 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 I guess right more times than I guess wrong in everything. So, so for me, one of my limitations as a filmmaker is that I see a certain thing that not necessarily everyone else sees. Because why, why is it that after making two successful Godfather films and, and, and the conversation in a row, Nobody wanted to back me to make Apocalypse Now. I mean, I basically had won a bunch of Oscars. I had arguably, you know, made a bunch of, by Hollywood terms and by business terms, made a bunch of successful films. And absolutely nobody uh, wanted to back me in, in, in that. Or, or even, even Paramount didn't want to back me so much they had to when I wanted to call the second Godfather film, The Godfather Part Two, instead of, you know, the son of, uh, of the mafia. Sequels always had names. No one had ever called anything Part Two. And that was the one little thing I asked for that they, they pushed back on. And I said, well, if you don't want to let me call, call it Godfather Part Two, I'll, I won't do it. And so they did. But then there was a slew of Part Twos. So obviously I was seeing something that they didn't see. So I would think one of my disadvantages as a filmmaker is that it takes sometimes 20 years for my idea to to earn the, the success of, of, of time, which is, you know, my feeling is like you can get good reviews, you can get bad reviews, you can have supporters, you can do a lot of business, stuff, but the greatest earmark of success is the test of time. If people are still looking at your movies in some enjoyment 50 years later then that's that's maybe the the greatest uh, medal of success well I'm 80 years old so I want to do a movie very badly now but I'm running into the same thing I ran into on Apocalypse Now people say oh well that's not really the kind of movie that people either want to see or actors want to be in same thing that happened with Apocalypse. the pity is that that if I do get to make like the film I want to make now, I don't have 20 years to to, to enjoy its possible uh, success. So uh, that, that the test of time works when you're 20 and it works when you're 30, but not when you're 80. <laughs> what keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? I think there's a lot to learn from the pandemic. Do are people saying, oh, how much? Am I worth? How much do I earn? They're saying, how safe are my loved ones? <laughs> you know, how 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 uh, how are my friends doing? So I mean, we're already having a change of priorities. I believe that once we change our main priorities, which is now towards production, basically getting wealth by selling things, making things that people don't really want, but sort of tricking them into wanting it through marketing that once, once it changes, not from gross national product, but to what's known as even the human uh, development index, uh, to life expectancy, to, to uh, uh, universal education. Uh, educated people are, are, are more understanding of other people's issues. They're not, they're less, uh, they're less, uh, uh, there's less animosity, you know, so, so, uh, I believe that if we focused on life expectancy, universal education, the freedom to have capabilities, to learn how to do things, we love to do things, and the freedom to do it, and justice, and above all, care of, the, uh, of, our, of our home, which is uh, the earth, uh, th that once we have new priorities, we'll evolve in a, in a way more towards friendship and generosity and empathy and kindness and, and uh, uh, cooperation and love, you know. So I, I see the human uh, race as having a positive future. This is what the theme of my, my work is. And, and therefore I feel even the cinema, the love of cinema, there will be an evolution that will be positive. Maybe the movie theater of the future will not be in the, in the, 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 in the, the mode 
that it's evolved in the present uh, theatre. But I wish it would change. I, I don't think that the consent decree which separated theatres from producers made better theatres. I, I, I would say arguably our movie theatres, uh, you know, we are designed thus just to make money any way it can are not the best format of theatre. So I think that will evolve a new kind of movie theatre uh, that is more in keeping with the notion of the movie palace of the past, which were beautiful places to go to, uh, with comfortable seats and without the smell of popcorn uh, and the, all the junk food that they're basically trying to make money on. So who knows? I mean, you don't eat popcorn in church. And to me, to go to a movie is a beautiful experience uh, uh, akin to, uh, to a, a religious uh, experience. You know, I remember a day when, when you went to a movie, uh, uh, some little old ladies were in front of the movie theater with a card table getting you to sign a petition to prohibit Pat Weaver from having what was essentially the beginning of uh, pay TV. And the argument was that pay TV is a terrible uh, thing to permit because not only would you pay for it, but they would also have commercials. And movie theaters will never have commercials. And every time I go to a movie and watch those commercials, I said, what happened to the promise that there would be no commercials? Not to mention the fact that the movie theater owners and the production people are always arguing as to who really should uh, sort of allow the other a privilege. Uh, and when the, the moment came for there to be electronic projection, which happened, of course, the theater owners wanted the studios to pay for it, and the studio owners wanted the theater owners to pay part for it. And the way it was resolved was an outside group came and bought them and, and taxes them because neither wanted to do it. All I'll tell you about the theaters, aside from the fact that I think personally that they do a terrible job of, of theatrical exhibition, which is what they're about. They're more interested in their side deals, their concessions, and their way to make money. But when a group of them get together socially, the wives of the theater owners have better jewelry than the wives of the movie producers, is what I noticed.